but I think we have everyone. Will Baker, are you there, Will? I'm here. Yes. Okay. And you and Jill Remick is also here. You were going to talk to us a little bit about the history. Um, the question I asked, I don't know if you were here or not, was did we always tax electric poles and wires? Or, uh, you know, when we thought, as we do with broadband, there was a necessity to get everybody hooked up as quickly as possible. And when did we start and how did we do it and whatever. We're just, we're just starting on this very technical road. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll go first. Jill Remick is also here and Jill, yeah. please chime, chime in if you'd like. It's, my name is Will Baker. I'm legal counsel at the Vermont Tax Department. Um, I, let me just start by saying that the underlying premise here is that uh, real property subject to property tax, land and buildings subject to property tax, um, personal property, business personal property uh, is uh, subject to municipal tax unless the municipality has decided not to tax it. And I believe that only four, about 44 municipalities tax business personal property at this point. So that's sort of the, that's, that's the underlying uh, foundation here. <clears throat> and then I should also mention that of our 30 tax types, property tax is actually not one of my specialties. So we may have to research um, questions okay. further and get back to the committee. And I'd also point out that property tax is a, is a um, uh, it, it spread over 251 towns. So we probably can't get you specific answers about our, is every single category subject to tax because we, we, we would have to go and go and look. The tax department itself doesn't list the properties the municipalities do. Uh, and then finally, even looking at the grand list, um, we, we often don't uh, get the level of specificity that this committee may want. In other words, if I run a shoe store or a consulting firm, it, that's still real property, commercial property, and it would be listed in the grand list as commercial property, right. whether it's a shoe store or a consulting firm. So um, we, we can't zero in, hone in on the grand list as far as internet providers or anyone else, any bit other business, um, probably to the level that you, you would be most helpful to you. Um, okay. So that, just, all that said- it in the taxation of poles and wires. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who, what's taxable, who taxes them? So generally um, there, there's, there's a couple different categories, but there's no, I, Jill, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the word internet appears anywhere in the property tax statutes. Um, so it, it's not like, it, we do not have a internet provider category of property and there's no specific rules for internet providers. Um, but we, there are some other categories that, that come into play here, but following the underlying premise that all land and buildings are subject to property tax and personal properties, some t depending on the town you're in, subject to municipal tax. Um, cable, like a cable TV provider who might also provide broadband internet through their cable um, network. Um, the, the land and buildings for a cable TV provider or internet or cable TV provider would be subject to property tax. And uh, okay. cables, lines, fixtures, and poles would be taxed, would be subject to education tax. Um, at, they're included in the definition of non-homestead property and the education tax. Okay, uh, so if Comcast strings fiber, or cable or whatever on poles owned by Green Mountain Power. 
who pays the property tax on that cable? I think I think it probably depends on who owns them. If Comcast, if it's Comcast cable and they string it in a particular municipality, it would be subject to um, uh, education tax. Cables, lines, fixtures, and poles are subject to the education tax. Um, okay. If if they don't own the pole but they own the cable, then I imagine that is the value that they would list that they would okay. uh, on which they would be taxed in the town. There All are right. some specific uh, rules that are slightly different for telephone companies um, in Vermont. Um, and it is possible that some telephone companies as defined also provide internet. Yep. Okay. And, and then um, Senator Cummings, you asked about the history um, I, my observation of this chapter uh, of Title 32 is that it does not change very often, and it's been in place for quite some time. Um, I, unfortunately, before, before 1947, I don't have a good way to research here at home. The, the statutes, our current, our current yeah. style of our statutes really got started in 19, about 1947. So that would be more like legal historical research. We might have some paper materials in our office, but I, I'm not in our office. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that this has been the general structure for quite some time, maybe forever. Um, I did review some materials, it, uh, not, it's not quite on point, it's not property tax, but we did have a franchise tax in Vermont on telephone and telegraph companies at, uh, since 1882. That it went in in 1882. So we have certainly been identifying telephone companies for tax for quite some time. I don't see anything that exempted them in the in the for the purpose of encouraging building out of that service. There certainly could have been one. Um, Certainly, could have been incentives to do that. I, I know that there was, there was incent, were incentives to do that. I just I don't see anything on the property tax side, um, the in the property tax area, suggesting anything like that. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Baker? Thank you, Michael. I was getting tired of looking at the top of your head. So you can talk. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Baker. Uh, I asked this question of a previous witness. Um, I don't know if you can answer it, but uh, we were informed that the revenues from property taxes on telephone poles, I don't know if it's limited to telephone poles, has dropped substantially in the last few years. Uh, and there was a concern about that. And I just don't understand how poles and wires, whether it's telephone or cable, whatever, get valued or assessed. And, you know, we hear a lot of talk about uh, the desire to use those poles by some companies for various purposes. And I don't know if their value goes up and who does reassessment or reappraisal like we do with homes. Um, can you educate us a little bit on this? Uh, the Jill. I, I can I can start and maybe Jill can can fill in some details. Telephone companies do enjoy a little bit uh, specialized tax treatment, and that's because of our telephone personal property tax in Vermont, which is a very old old tax. Also, has not changed very much over the years. So, for a telephone company, and a telephone company is is defined as someone operating a telephone business. Um, pretty broad definition. Uh, of course, land and buildings subject to property tax as usual, as you might expect. But the poles and lines, um, there's a special uh, telephone personal property tax on those, on that equipment. Um, and that's a tax on the net book value of the personal property tax. Uh, and then they're exempt from any municipal uh, 
personal property tax. And uh, the personal prop the state personal property tax is on the net book value of those assets, which I, I believe the prior witness is correct uh, in the general statement that that's a that is a number that is shrink shrinking over time uh, as those assets are older and over older. And um, my understanding is that there's not a whole lot of conventional telephone upgrades occurring right now. I'm not, I don't have the technical background for that. So I don't know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that, but I mean, I mean the, the older, the older tell what I think was an old fashioned telephone line um, upgrades. So a tax on the net book value, uh, the, the tax base on, on that would and, uh, and is shrinking over time. So um, there seems to be, I'm sure you could probably come up with, or we could come up with some examples where that might produce some inequities. But in terms of, uh, I was struck by you saying there's no right for a municipality to tax the telephone poles? Is, is, I, there, is there an example of similar utility property that, ha, that enjoys that exemption? Um, I, I believe that's correct, that if the asset is subject to the telephone personal property tax, it, it is not subject to any municipal personal property tax. Um, and is there any comparable um, uh, situation like that? The only thing I can think of is um, utility property that's actually owned by the municipality and occurring in that municipality. That would also be exempt from municipal tax. But that's the only example. That's the only similar example I can think of. Well, a starting point for, for me or for this committee might be to do some comparison to how other states treat this property. Um, do you know off the top of your head whether other states have updated their statutes uh, to, uh, to uh, reflect the loss in revenue or the inequities of certain personal property of a utility being exempt while we all pay our own tax, other businesses pay taxes on their personal property? Uh, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know specifically. Okay. I, I know we've made changes. I think one of the issues is that the, who, who's the last person you know that put in a landline? Um, everybody's getting rid of their landlines and going to cell phones. I know we've had the smaller telephone systems in a number of years ago because they were regulated. They had to go through full PUC hearings to do bundled programs. They have to provide the um, lifeline connectivity and cell phones don't. And VoIP, voice over internet. Um, so if Comcast or any of those providers, we can't tax that, right? We can't tax internet. So anything going over there, I don't know about cell phones. Do we tax, and we came up with cell towers were vague as to how they got defined. So um, the industry is changing. The feds have tied our hands in some areas and yet we've still got some regulated utilities out there in telephone. The service has been restored if everybody's not getting the same pop-ups I'm getting. So we're back online live. Senator Pearson and then Senator McDonald. Um, thank you. I, I'm the, the, the proposal that has come to us is to uh, let the co-ops build some infrastructure that will be used by the CUDs. Now, if the CUDs could build it, 
we've all agreed they would not be subject to the property tax. And um, it, it's it's an interesting question because it's a it's a question of ownership technically, but really the user, you know, the person that's using it, uh, it's already clear there wouldn't be tax. So I guess I'm, you know, if the CUDs could contract with the, the co-op to do the, the work of building it, that would also not be subject to the property tax. The trick is the um, co-op has a access to a, a very favorable financial interest uh, inter, instrument to be able to fund the whole thing. My question is, um, it, did, from your point of view, is there a concern? Is there an integrity um, issue if we, if we give them this exemption um, for this purpose? To me, it, it does seem to jive with our desire to build out broadband and our desire to make it be fiber and to empower the CUDs. Um, so I, I'm just curious if, if you would have concerns with this proposal, if it has integrity to you. Um, I don't I don't know a whole lot about this proposal. And I frankly, I don't know what a CUD is. Um, it's a commun a community union district, communications union district. Union district. It's okay. EC Fiber. EC it? Fiber, Central Vermont Fiber. And okay. we have defined them as municipalities. Okay. Um, and I, I, perhaps uh, Joe Remick should chime in on this as well. From the tax department's point of view, what we always really like to see is clear definitions of an exemption from tax or clear definitions of what is subject to tax. So me personally, um, I don't have any concerns if, if certain property was going to be exempt for certain use, as long as um, that would be workable for the company or the district, the, the utility, uh, to identify what is within this exemption and what isn't. And, and then likewise for municipal assessors in the state to, to uh, do the same. Okay. I know one, one other comment I'll make about that is uh, I, I could see a problem uh, occurring if um, they conducted both taxable and exempt business over the same piece of equipment. My thinking there is a cable television cable and a cable broadband modem or, you know, something like that, where it, you're using, you're using the, um, underlying asset for perhaps more than one thing. And if those are, if the tax treatment is different for those two things, I could see that being a complication for the company to sort of try to prorate or calculate in some way how, how much of it is being used for the taxable purpose or the exempt purpose. That, that could be problematic. But if the whole, if the whole asset is being used for one purpose and we had yeah. a clear definition of that purpose and taxable or exempt, um, that that would certainly satisfy me and probably the tax department. Okay, Jill, any thoughts? Hi everyone, Jill Remick. I'm the director of property valuation and review at the tax department. Um, I wanted to just go back and provide a little bit more foundation to one of the original questions about how utilities are currently assessed. Um, if you do try to find information about utilities in the statute, different utilities exist in different places. And so it is, it's not sort of all really laid out very clearly. And you can tell over time things have been added and, and, um, and amended. So um, in some cases regarding like cable TV and electric, it's, it's pretty outdated and unchanged from uh, a long time ago, but then we do have sections in there specifically for things like solar and cell tower. Um, so it's it's a partnership between the state and the municipalities. I think that's part of um, why this is so challenging and hard for us to give you folks definitive answers because yeah, that um, it we aren't able to report to you, okay, this is what broadband providers are currently being assessed at and this is what they're paying in property tax because um, the statute, the way it is right now, doesn't contemplate the, the term broadband, right? You can get it from your cable. Like I have mine through my TV cable that comes in my house. 
my mom in the Northeast Kingdom has a satellite dish and that's how she gets her internet. So it's, it's, um, it's hard to quantify. I don't want you folks to think we're trying to be evasive, but, um, but right now, you know, as with a lot of the property valuation, then when there's something physical, there's real property or personal property that's measurable that we can assess, we can do that. Um, I think what we're running up against here is that I do think, um, you know, utility valuation in Vermont is a little ripe for some revisiting and freshening just in general um, to keep up with what's happening in 2021, where it really hasn't changed substantially um, for the past several years. And uh, um, so I wanted to make sure that I I just made that clear that, that depending on the type of utility and the sort of bucket that it falls in, it's treated a little differently in statute. And either um, and every year we collect a inventory from all the utilities. So to get at like the, the poles and the lines and things like that, we collect that every year from all of the municipality or all the utilities. Um, and then we um, we have a formula related to what's called the Handy Whitman. It's a it's a national formula. It's a, sort of a standard of what the uh, the inventory nationally is doing and that gives us a value so then the municipality can either use that value or they can um, come up with their own utility value so if you have a, a particularly high value commercial utility in your in your town you may want to actually take the time to invest in having um, you know a professional utility appraiser actually provide that valuation um, the state does have a partnership with the towns related specifically to the trans canada hydro so there is an expert utility appraiser these are who provides their expertise and their valuing on those. Um, it's not something that we have the expertise in house at, um, at the tax department to actually do that. It's a pretty specialized field. So I'm, I'm happy to have this sort of come before you folks so we can sort of start to unpack some of these pieces. Um, but right now, you know, we've kind of built this, this system, you know, the technology is moving faster than, than the statute and the tools that we have to come up with proper values. Um, in other states, we, we spend a lot of time with our counterparts in New Hampshire, as you can imagine, property tax is a, is a worthwhile investment for their, their valuation team at their tax department. You know, they have a whole staff of folks who do utility valuation, um, and it's, it's really much more based on sort of an income approach on a business model. It's almost like their team does more of an audit of their, you know, FCC filings and things like that, and that's how they come up with the value, and then they can, they can apportion that. Um, you know, based on the number of ratepayers in towns, or, you know, we're also kind of unique in that we divide it by municipalities in a lot of places, it's maybe more like the county or statewide. So we have been doing a lot of looking into what Vermont could do better, you know, what um, tools would help us more accurately capture what we need, and also to um, get us some more training on how we can support the towns to come up with these values. So utilities is definitely something we've been, we've been trying to dig into a little bit deeper. Um, but yeah, to, to Will's point too, depending on the type of utility it is, it is treated differently in statute and it might be personal property that is taxed at the municipal level, it may not be. Um, so it's, it's, it's worth a discussion. Okay, Senator McDonald. Um, Madam Chair, I'm, it's interesting to know that utility uh, may be ripe for changes. Um, and we're discussing value here. Um, Broadband, um, at least symmetrical broadband, has been valued by um, many in the recent years as the single most valuable thing we can do for economic development. So my question is, um, for the witnesses who just testified, is there any reason why they think um, a law which said notwithstanding current practices, this um, broadband to be defined as, as uh, you know, symmetrical up to such and such or a federal definition of broadband. Is there any reason why um, such a law would be overthrown by, for being um, you know, preempted or et cetera, et cetera? And that's pretty much it. If they have a reason to share it, if they don't have a reason, say they can say no. And um, the second question would be if we were to draft such a bill, um, would they come and comment on it and whether or not they thought it was a wise and thoughtful way to achieve um, the number one valued economic development tool of broadband throughout the state of Vermont? Those are the, my two questions. And who is, who is oh. your question aimed at? Well, we've had, had a couple, 
one witness said that um, they didn't see any reason why we couldn't pass such a law. Miss um, uh, Remick, do you see any reason why we couldn't pass such a law? Would we be preempted? Sure, I think I think the way that it could be effective and um, and implemented is to be really clear to your point about what the definition of broadband is. And in so many of these cases, the utility is offering multiple services. So how how to parse out if you are a, a Comcast or something that that uses it for telephone and cable and broadband? You know how you parse that out if you're treating them differently for taxation purposes. Um, so as long as those things could be clearly defined so that we at PVR and then the municipality can quantify that value, um, then I, I'm, I'm sure that the providers would love to come in. I, I, I haven't interacted much with broadband providers, but we've certainly um, had conversations with like electric um, telephone and other, other utility providers. So I would assume they would also want to um, come in and, and speak about how that might impact their liability or their decision about whether they do offer broadband using their existing infrastructure or or build out. So I'm, I'm sure there's others in the in the industry who would love to participate in that conversation and have much more to say than I would have. About oh, yeah. That. Well, if, if, Madam Chair, I'm trying to, if we were to say that it is not to be taxed, um, then the value of what the thing is that isn't going to be taxed is would be interesting to discuss. Um, but, you know, zero times something is zero. So um, for broadband on cooperatively owned poles um, to be leased under certain conditions to provide broadband service to the, those areas, um, now maybe some will tell us whether that would be a good idea or not. And, Okay. In the interest of achieving the number one goal professed by many for our economic development. So. I, I think we're the ones that are going to decide if it's a good idea or not. Okay. Well, then we don't need the witnesses to comment on that. Um, are we ready to present them with a, a bill that they can comment on whether it does and is clear enough to do the job? Right. And whether or not it's legal. That's my okay. question. Okay. <laughs> I've had one other example, if you don't mind, I know it's getting late. Um, one of your questions was just about how different entities are treated differently. Um, I don't think there's any pocket that's sort of getting away with anything, but certainly the sort of inventory and tracking of the resources is, is our biggest challenge at PBR and the town's biggest challenge. If we don't know about it, we don't know that we're missing that, you know, missing to yeah. identify that entity. Um, one that comes to mind that I think is, is timely is, is the railroad corporate tax. So we still at PBR, value railroads based on their track mileage and collect revenue on that and disperse that among the towns based on the miles of track. And because of that, those, um, those railroad entities, that's their payment of their corporate tax. So they're exempt from a corporate tax. So there are ways to, I think it might've been Senator Pearson who was asking about, um, you know, making sure that we're capturing the right, the right assessment through the right venue. So there are other examples where that, that goes in the reverse, right? That if they're they're not paying real uh, real property tax. It doesn't mean they're not in another way, maybe, um, you know, paying some form of, of assessment on their property. Maybe I just made it more complicated. I apologize. No, and I, I know Co that- Co-ops pay, pay corporate taxes. Not corporate. Okay, so if the answer is no, then that's, that's not an issue from the co-op point of view of paying taxes on this. Or if it is an issue, someone please- Say so. Okay. All right. I don't know if it is, if anyone knows that or not. Um, and things change. The railroads are not the economic drivers and necessities they were 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, things have changed for landline telephones and our challenge is to make sure that our taxing structure is fair and you know doesn't disadvantage anyone and also helps encourage behavior perhaps we'd like to see. So with that, not seeing any other um, questions, I'm gonna say thank you to everyone. Um, and we will see the rest of the committee here tomorrow afternoon. Um, 
And I think Faith has posted the agenda. It, it will be up. It's pretty full for next week, too. Get any issues you'd like to have put on the agenda to me, and we'll find a space to get them in. And we'll just keep getting on. Thank you.